Um, hi, folks. Thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm Tomahuarna. I'm a grad student here in CMS. Uh, I'm a researcher at State's Initiative. And my thesis is called uh, Trust Machines, Crypto uh, Cryptocurrencies, Blockchains, and Humans in Cultures of Mistrust. So um, since it appears twice, let me uh, start by introducing three key points about trust, all right? So trust, according to Simo, is a capacity to forecast future actions. So it is essentially the main condition to exist in a society with strangers. We need to have some capacity to know that things will go a certain way. Second, Giddens, uh, another sociologist, adds that trust is not just reliability. It is very much faith. And, and not only faith, but it's a blind faith. So for Giddens, we can trust in two ways. Uh, when we trust our friends or family, or when we trust abstract principles um, to be true. So for example, when we're traveling by plane, we don't really know, we, we don't really need to know how a plane works. We just trust it's gonna work. Um, and Giddens adds a third thing, that modern institutions rely on people's trust in abstract systems. And a good example of this is, for example, the finance system, right? Uh, so for example, when we are exchanging money, we don't really need to understand the whole dynamics of what goes through our credit card transaction, we just trust that money is gonna be honored. So which brings me to public institutions, all right? Uh, which play a, a role in our society as trust mediators. So they, broker tr uh, they broker trust between strangers. So according to Fukuyama, uh, modern state institutions emerge in societies with historically low interpersonal trust. So in other way, they facilitate interactions between people who would normally not trust each other. Uh, and they do this through contracts or laws and policies. Uh, but modern states are not just a functional aspect of these institutions. Benedict Anderson says that the national states are rooted in something called imagined communities. Uh, so media technologies like books, maps, census, they, uh, they help just diffuse this idea that we all share some common identity, that we're a part of something bigger. And, uh, so imagine communities uh, go from this idea of uh, they expand trust from our close friendships to something bigger, to a wider polity. And Robert Putnam talks about two accounts of trust. One is based on our personal, strong, frequent relationships, thick trust, and thin trust, which refers to the trust we have uh, with uh, people with some shared social networks or expectations of, of reciprocity. So imagine communities ex enable this thin trust. But what happens when people mistrust these institutions. Um, so Ethan Zuckerman argues that when some people confront oppressive systems, they can become insurrectionists who try to overthrow and upheave existing systems. And one of these levers for change is code. Uh, network technologies are interesting because they can indeed transfer attributions that were before monopolies of the state to market systems. So for example, before social media platforms like Facebook, censorship was something that more or less generally the state only did now with this platform is an attribution that is shared to the market. And in Cole, Lawrence Lessig argues that the internet is governed by something called merchant sovereignties who profit, who prioritize profit making over public good and provide no accountability to the public. He says that our relationship to them, to them is the same that we have to McDonald's. Um, so my interest is in these technological systems as market sovereignties. These are trust machines, technological systems the media trust and that operate through, through, through market principles. So specifically, these are my research questions. First, how is technological trust mediator addressing a perceived mistrust in public institutions? What are the individual and collective practices involved in this new mediation? What is the role of affect and emotion? And how are public institutions transforming in response to these emerging imaginaries? And I explored this question by focusing on a specific case study, which is the use of crypto cryptocurrencies in Argentina, and let me show you why, and before, before that, I'm gonna have a sip of water. So this thesis focuses on a specific long dated competence of the state, which is governing money. So as most uh, folks know here, uh, James Carey points at two visions of communications as transmission and communication as ritual. So scholars of media studies have studied money as both of these things. So first in the poor man's credit card, Marshall McLuhan says that Money talks because money is a metaphor, a transfer, a bridge. As a vast social metaphor, a bridge or translator, money, like writing, speeds up the exchange and tightens the bonds of interdependence in any community. And the new money, Lana Swartz says that money technologies produce transactional communities, networks of relations united by a common sense of identity, geography, and values. And I'm happy to talk more about this review in the Q&A if folks have any questions about how media studies addresses money. 
Now let's move on to, uh, to the technology that we're looking at, which is cryptocurrencies. And these are digital currencies that exist in blockchains, which are decentralized records that are composed of blocks that are tied together through cryptography. And this might not be super clear, and I'm happy to answer more technical questions, but what we need to know is that it works like decentralized digital money. And the blockchain was invented in 2008 by a mysterious figure called Satoshi Nakamoto, who we don't know who that is, and to support Bitcoin, which is a cryptocurrency. And Nakamoto published Bitcoin uh, in the white paper of Bitcoin, a mailing list about crypto cryptography, as a new technology uh, that enables a peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash that, will allow, that would allow direct payments without going through a financial institution. And then on Bitcoin, the most utilized blockchain is Ethereum blockchain. Ethereum is an open source blockchain created in 2013, relies on a cryptocurrency called Ether, and it has two main innovations that it supports smart contracts, which are code that is executed automatically in this blockchain, and it supports tokens, which are other cryptocurrencies in the Ethereum blockchain. And now, why am I focused on Argentina? Uh, for many reasons. For one, Argentina has gone through a series of political economic crisis. I'm just gonna say that because I could just spend the entire presentation on that. And secondly, after an inflationary crisis in, crisis in 2001, Argentina has had increasing inflation. Um, then in June, 2021, Argentina ranked uh, 10th in each analysis global cryptocurrency adoption index, which means that Argentina are adopting crypto at an unusual rate. And in Edelman's 2022 Trust Barometer, our uh, survey of 27 countries, Argentina ranked last in two categories, trust in government and trust in the central bank. And also in Argentina, we can see the existence of, um, of informal economic networks like barter networks, clandestine currency exchanges when people can bypass the government's restrictions on purchasing foreign currency. So my focus in, in understanding cryptocurrencies in Argentina allows me to understand how a technological trust mediator, cryptocurrencies, is understood alongside problems in public institutions. So about my methods, I conducted in-depth interviews with 15 cryptocurrency users, enthusiasts, and blockchain technology developers in Argentina. Uh, I recruited them through something that I call extended snowball sampling, which is getting in touch with people that my informants mentioned, but also seeing who they share Twitter spaces or other virtual communities with. I use digital ethnography methods to understand how users engage in virtual communities, and lastly, I use the walkthrough method to uh, explore the artifacts that users engage with. And this method, as described by Lloyd Burgess and Dugway, aims to establish a software application's environment of expected use, which is how an app provider expects it will be received, generate profit or other forms of benefit, uh, and regulate user activity. So I will now present the chapters in my thesis and some of the findings. So my first chapter is called the legacy systems. And I'm gonna spend a bit more time on this one because it's especially important. So scholars of media know that adoption of media technologies is tied to the visions of its users. So social political context is important, but they only tell a part of the picture. It also matters how a technology is framed as a solution to a problem. Um, for scholars of media studies, this might ring a bell, which is Winston's idea of supervening social necessities, but looking at the role of ideology too. So in this chapter, I look at how blockchains and cryptocurrencies are framed as updates for outdated legacy systems. Traditional institutions are, are, are seen as outdated artifacts that these technologies come to revolutionize. As Luis, an informant told me, crypto libera liberates individuals from a lot of obstacles set by institutions that don't really work for them. So three public institutions are addressed here, the national state, traditional finance, and public identity. So um, first, national states are seen as mistrusted. So my informants often frame crypto as bypassing national borders and offering a level field for people worldwide. Its revolutionary potential was understood through the recentering of the capacity of individuals. But it's not just about individualism. The playing field vision applies also to social barriers. And Nicolas, a 27-year-old cryptocurrency trader, explained to me the adoption of, of the technologies relies on the solidarity of the Argentine crypto community. Crypto for me is literal liberty and the capacity to engage with people who traditionally would not be at your level. In the crypto world, you can easily talk to someone who has 50 or 500 Bitcoins without this person talking down on you. You can have a conversation in the same wavelength. Another institution that, uh, that was opposed was traditional finance. Another informant said that crypto comes to decentralize and change the way that institutions use money. So I'm not in favor of the idea that you give money to the bank and the bank moves around the money and then they charge you. 
And this software relates to how the government uses money, which is related to, to inflation, they say. And lastly, public identity is a contested idea. They negotiate the idea of the, anonym, the anonymity granted by decentralized networks, but also the idea of publicness needed in the sociality of the, of, the, of the technology, engaging in something I call fluid anonymity. And what's interesting here is that Argentine entrepreneurs and developers are imagining new institutions using blockchain technologies. And an example of this is Decentraland, a project developed that situates a virtual 3D world in the blockchain and works through by smart contracts, making its government incorruptible and fully transparent. Another project we're mentioning is Proof of Humanity, which is a <clears throat> which is a registry of individuals on the blockchain where users can validate their identity as, as humans and automatically receive money. These are profit-making enterprises, of course. As each project becomes, becomes more popular, their tokens become more pricey and the assets of, assets of the original creators increase in value but they can also be seen as experiments in world, experiments in world building of understanding what artifacts are necessary to replace the obsolete ones that sustain the national state as such. So in the second chapter, I critically engage with the idea of trustlessness in the blockchain um, that is commonly presented as a tourism in the literature. The idea of trustlessness presents an essential binary between the everyday world and the blockchain, decentralized trustless blockchain. Um, and this chapter aims to deconstruct this opposition. So by focusing on the different gateways to acquiring cryptocurrencies by Argentine users, I aim to highlight the role of off-chain transactions in determining one's engagement with cryptocurrencies. So I analyze a series of, a series of technologies and arrangements or human and non-human actors, uh, like custodial and non-custodial wallets, or local exchanges and clandestine brokers, peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces. And I find that how a user engages with cryptocurrency is dependent on choices that are dependent on the political or social ties existing, existent in the off-chain world. Uh, for example, non-custodial wallets were artifacts uh, for managing cryptocurrencies where users have access to the private and public keys, which makes it very private, but also very risky. The users of this shared the user of this technology shared with me a vision of complete mistrust in the government, but custodial wallets, wallets that rely on businesses and therefore uh, need users to authenticate their identity and this identity is shared with the government, uh, were understood as a bridge between the off-chain government relations and the affordances of the blockchain. They were also associated with the reliance on, the reliance on legal safeguards um, since they are legal entities. Another interesting finding was that when, so, when social media platforms like Facebook were used like a marketplace for cryptocurrencies, the affordances of Facebook to build trust that the requirement to use real names were repurposed by the users. The third chapter focuses on how communitarism is performed in the community and centers the role of affect and emotion in community building. Wagmi is a common phrase among Ethereum enthusiasts that means we're all gonna make it. It does not re represent all the crypto community, but it's a, it's a good representation of the idea of solidarity and communitarism in, in Argentina's crypto community. And community building is seen as an important task for crypto enthusiasts. Um, uh, Natalia, an informant, described the community as a place for consultation. She believes there are three big pillars in a community, bringing new people into the community, making the community grow, and making sure that making it so the communities contribute to that community. Cryptocurrency users employ different social media platforms and chat applications to fulfill different communicative needs. For example, Twitter is useful to connect with like-minded enthusiasts, um, but the information there has an expectation of authoritativeness. Discord and Telegram are useful as spaces for specific interests or affinities and to share information more casually. And being semi-public, they can allow newcomers to cryptocurrencies to ask questions. And WhatsApp groups are seen as more intimate and allow for information to be shared less authoritatively allowing users to share riskier projects. And here's an interesting thing. Uh, so this communities, uh, this community spaces also play a role in managing emotions collectively, like foot, which is fear, uncertainty, and doubt, and FOMO, the fear of missing out uh, when a new project appears. And the volatility of the cryptocurrencies is emotionally taxing, so virtual communities act as enthusiast support systems. As an informant told me, I mean, who in your family can understand what you go through in this chaos that goes so fast. And lastly, different communities engage in different gatekeeping strategies to authorize and validate information. So for example, a community uh, for women in crypto 
uh, the community, the moderators of community for women in crypto demand links to be validated beforehand with them. So um, before they have posted in their group and they didn't see this as holding authority, but as protecting community members from misinformation and granting them tools to make decisions by themselves. And lastly, the last chapter in my thesis is about future making. And this is a big thing about my thesis. This emerging imaginary is affecting how institutions understand themselves. So in this final chapter, I ask, how are public institutions uh, transforming in response to these emerging imaginaries? And in this chapter, I perform a close reading of a white paper recently published by the City of Buenos Aires Secretary of Innovation and Digital Transformation, created in, col in collaboration with developers on the blockchain community. And the paper is about identity protocols based on the blockchain, and it echoes many of the values and visions I identified in this first chapter, a vision of decentralization, the recentering of individuals, and granting users power over their value. This is in line with the vision of what Eric Gordon and I call transparent institutions, guided by the erasure of discretion and automatic enforcement through smart contracts. The erasure of discretion is something that's been at the core of Bever's vision of the bureaucratic state, but other social theories like Lipsky or Saka uh, argue that, it, that discretion is actually essential to public service provision. So in a way, the blockchain promises a reversal of Giddens' understanding of trust in modern institution. So as a reminder, uh, Giddens said that when we trust modern institutions, we trust in abstract systems, things that we don't really know or cannot really think about. But the blockchain, uh, but blockchain users do not primarily place trust in abstract systems. They do so in the material system of the blockchain itself. So blockchain presents an opportunity for public institutions to provide effective functions without the need for the institution to be trusted itself outside those functions. So this is a new vision of trust that is supported of these new technologies. So all right, thank you for listening. And I hope this presentation has provided you with, uh, with a window into, into the imaginaries behind this technology with, behind what this technology means for a collective life. life. And thank you, and I would like to especially thank my advisors, Eric Gordon and T.L. Taylor, who have been fantastic mentors, my cohort, who, have been, who has been an ideal community to think with, uh, folks at the Civic Design Initiative, the Latin American Media Studies Reading Group, and my friends and family in Boston and Buenos Aires who have been incredible support for this. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much. This is fantastic. Uh, I would want to ask you about uh, if you could talk more about La Cueva yeah. and the ecosystem in Argentina because I think I don't know if you ended up like going there and exploring that, but for me that was fascinating. Yeah, I, I yes, sir. So Amber asked me about Cuevas, which are clandestine establishment where you can trade different currencies and buy crypto. Um, and if I gone there, I have not gone there, but um, luckily there uh, is a topic that's been explored in the literature, not about crypto, but uh, so, oh wait, context about Argentina, you cannot buy uh, US dollars legally because the government forbids that to keep inflation low and prices lower. But so, so what you actually, when you wanna buy dollars to save against inflation, you have to go to Cuevas, which are clandestine, clandestine establishments which are actually pretty front facing because the government tolerates them a lot. So, um, so the situation around Cuevas is that Cuevas also trade in crypto, all right? So they can either sell you uh, currencies like uh, Ether or, or Bitcoin, but they can also sell you something called stable coins, which are um, cryptos that are tied to $1. So you know, it was know that your token is also always gonna be $1. And there are two things here, uh, when you, when you engage with a cueva, you're usually using your non-custodial wallet, which uh, is a very is a risky thing because if imagine you have some sort of problem with a cueva, um, then you have no one to you know you have no recourse. You have you cannot tell the government, hey, this person sold for me. So, for example, an informant told me that a cueva um, that someone had gone through an interaction with a cueva where they actually sent them their wallet to exchange to send them their crypto to but the Cueva uh, administrator actually swiped and got their private wallet, which means they took uh, power over the entire wallet. And, and this informant told me, well, then, you know, since the blockchain is pretty transparent and you can actually trace transactions very easily, uh, people, you know, trace back to where, this, uh, where the transactions were taken and then really tarnished the, 
the reputation of the cueva, right? But the thing is that the, the reputation of the cueva, that only gets known in a very small circle. So that actually uh, sheds light on how social capital, uh, off-chain social capital from you know, the real world affects our engagement with the, with the blockchain, right? So that's interesting. And also something very interesting is that for, uh, so my informant told me that cuevas are good for small amounts, but when you wanna have bigger amounts, you need an arbolito. An arbolito is one that it's like a smaller scale cueva, which uh, pretty much goes to your house and you go to their house or to somewhere more private. And that person like it's a reliable, uh, reliable transactor for big amounts. So um, you need to be introduced to those people. They're not people you can find on the street like with us. So that also should slide on how social capital uh, uh, works there. So you know when you're trusting the arbolito, you're actually trusting the person who put you in touch with the arbolito, and the arbolito knows that you cannot like you know cannot play tricks because you'll be sacrificing your relationship with that. Thank you. And I was really struck by the CEO who died in Los Angeles. He scandals millions, millions of dollars in And I was really struck in watching this how much was not transparent. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole rhetoric of transparency around crypto, but actually in practice, there's <coughs> not much. Yeah. And, or at least there are points where there's lots of opacity or the labor knowledge of the data and this So so I guess I wanted one more piece. Sense how it's about transparency the rhetoric. Yeah. So TL asks about the rhetoric of transparency and how that is contrasted to reality where things might be much more opaque and power relations might be especially salient. And there are there is a great paper about that about Gilly Vidan, which actually sheds light on how, for example, Bitcoin has the idea of being decentralized, for example. But there are actually a bunch of uh, factors that have a lot of more power, like miners or whales, which are people who own a lot of crypto and they can also have a lot of market power on things. Um, but regarding the idea of transparency, I think, you know, um, I think I care a lot about the discourse of transparency and how is that as a discursive thing and to see how institutions respond to that and whether they do it in a meaningful way or not. And I think a lot of work has done in actually, you know, like, uh, uncovering the real um, power relations in the blockchain and say, well, this idea of, of, of democraticness, of communitarism, of horizontality is problematic. And I think that it's interesting, but it's not exactly what I was trying to do with my thesis. I was to some extent taking the discourse of my informants for granted and respecting them, uh, what they had to say and, and kind of exploring these ideas and then see how this discourse is, discourse is read by institutions and replicated. That's what I do in my last chapter. So I, I think that what's valuable, um, it's not necessarily whether things are, are materially true or not, because in, in reality, if people think or believe that some one thing is true, that is valuable, and that is a zeitgeist. That, that defines the media moment, right? The ideology, essentially, uh, which is why I think my thesis pays a lot of attention to two categories, which are ideology and imaginaries. So imaginaries is this category that uh, Sheila Jasenoff invented over here at Harvard, uh, over there at Harvard. Um, and it's the idea that people have these visions of technology in their heads, right? And that these visions are shared collectively, and then they become stabilized and crystallized in institutions, right? When the government or a public institution says, all right, we're going to go forward this direction, right? And I'm interested in seeing that jump. So I think there's a lot of work on the material actuality, on the contrast between decentralization and decentralized and centralization, the power relations, but um, I think other people do much better than me. Thank you. Yeah, so actually, so Shushti asked me about how media studies uh, addresses money. So actually something interesting about media is that the, like the origins of the word medium are tied to money, right? Medium of exchange. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a very long competency. Also, of media, but also social sciences, right? Not only economics, which are, you know, the science of money, but also the idea that, for example, Giddens, when he talks about trust and abstract systems, 
he talks about exchange system, money as an abstract system, right? Uh, but now there have been uh, two big books recently that address this, which are Lana Swartz, CMS, uh, CMS uh, person uh, who, um, who talks about new money and the transactional communities and media technologies and the, the communitarian part and the cultural aspect of this. Um, and Finn Burden, who talks about digital cash. And these two books, I think, are, are giving a twist on, on money that I think is really interesting. And that is, I think, um, Trace, it's, it actually sheds light on a, on a shift we're seeing where all of our, of our apps, especially the ones on by Meta, are now becoming apps to send us money, all right? So for example, WhatsApp in Brazil is piloting um, how sending payments through, through WhatsApp. Um, um, I know WeChat offers a, a, a chat uh, money transaction. And you know, Venmo, as Lana Swartz talks about it in a book, it's essentially social media. So it's a new attention that all scholars of media, so the media studies are paying attention to money. Um, and I think that's a very exciting uh, direction. Yes. So the question was about, um, well, the idea of trustlessness um, should be maybe more complicated because when you're engaging with cryptocurrencies, you trust, for example, wallets or companies, or these are different ways of mediating with the government. And I think that's a very interesting point and something I do challenge in my thesis. So there's this idea of trustlessness, which is a, a, an idea that was crystallized in academic literature by Pimaira de Filippi, um, also Harvard. Um, and what this idea of trustlessness, I I, I aim to deconstruct it a little bit because one thing is when it's uh, echoed by our informants. And I think that in that, in that case, it's, it's good to pull it out as a discursive thing. But when we replicate it on the literature, it becomes a bit more shaky, right? Because I think we should address it more critically. So what I do in chapter, in chapter two of my thesis is I deconstruct the deal of trustlessness, right? Um, but I, I do see that there are some, some ways of bypassing the government. So for example, you have two, two wallets, all right? Two, like, ways of wallets. One are non-custodial wallets, where you actually own your public and private key, which are the things that in the blockchain give you authority over handling transactions, which is the power over your money. And then there's, um, there's custodial exchanges. Custodial exchanges are companies, right? Uh, you don't have power over your, public, over your private keys. Uh, you can only see your, pri your public key and your private key is owned by the government. So when you're trying to buy crypto, you're buying crypto against the company. Right, so these companies are registered with the government. Um, they, you know, if if your money goes missing, you can, you know, go to the government. Hey, you, you, these guys took my money. Um, but then again, it requires these companies to tell the government who you are. It requires you to go to something called KYC, which is like a know your customer uh, process. So um, whereas non custodial wallets, you can actually go to a Cueva or a, a, any clandestine exchange and actually have a transaction without the government knowing what goes in the middle. So I think trusting the government there, I think there is something interesting about the government being bypassed as an institution in something that the government had power of over, which is money, right? Either the Argentine government or the US government with the US dollars, but essentially a competence of the government. Um, regardless, the idea of mediations of trust, I agree that the idea of trustlessness is not very useful as it is a, a discursive construct, right? Um, but I do think that it's interesting to look at the mediations of trust and see what networks of trust emerge in that way, right? So for example, when I'm trusting a custodial wallet, I am to some extent trusting the government. I am to some extent trusting the, the company that made the, the custodial wallet. And when I'm not trusting, when I'm using a non-custodial wallet, I'm trusting the clandestine person who is doing a peer-to-peer -peer transaction 
or I'm trusting the social media network through which I found the other person like Facebook or, or Binance's peer-to-peer -peer network. Thank you. All right, thank you.